I've suggested that stakeholder judgments about an organization's culture and its CSR efforts are going to influence how well it's able to respond to a crisis and how believable its responses are going to be. I've also shown a pathway for organizations to help build their values-oriented capacity for crisis response. But that's not the only way an inside-out approach to crisis capacity building should be explored. It's also imperative that employees be treated as strategic and vital stakeholders in order to ensure that organizations can effectively respond to crises. So let me come back to the case of BP's explosion in the Gulf of Mexico to help make the point. In 2014, I had the occasion to hear Brian Gilvari, BP's Chief Financial Officer, CFO, during the crisis, speak about his experience in crisis response and also talk with him later about it. As CFO, Gilvari was a long way from the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, but his group's work was essential in order for BP to respond. BP had to free up tens of millions of dollars very quickly in order to not only fund the process to stop the spill and clean it up, but also ensure that those affected could receive the support they needed. He talked about the hardest part of getting the job done was keeping his team focused because everyone was profoundly emotional about the loss of life, the continuing risks, and the personal attacks they were receiving as employees of BP for the situation. We'll come back to crisis leadership in the next podcast, but had Gilvari's team not been successful in their efforts to make vast sums of money available, then BP would not have been able to respond to the crisis in the way they wanted. So this leads me to the core assumption regarding employees and crisis capacity building. So the central assumption is that building employee capacity is vital to crisis response. It's the work that employees do that ensure an organization can respond, and organization's employees represent the material capacity for crisis response. So this is why they must be considered as a vital stakeholder group and the relationship between them and their organization managed effectively before, during, and after crises emerge. Aside from the material response that employees offer, they're also an organization's best ambassadors and the front line of the defense of its reputation. But this discussion dovetails with a broader discussion about the needs of communication and management professionals. So in this podcast, we're going to take a look at some of the broader needs for skill building in the field of communication, as well as the hard and soft skills needed by organizations to build crisis capacity. While there is limited research on the topic of employees and crisis communication or crisis capacity, what there is suggests that employee reactions are likely to be influenced by several factors. For example, recent research has found that when employees don't feel prepared for crises, it can lead to poor morale and productivity. Additionally, when employees don't feel like they have a voice in the company, it negatively affects decision making during crises. And finally, effective internal communication and information sharing can help to safeguard trust relationships within an organization during crises. So this leads us to some very specific recommendations for improving crisis response capacity that focus on the hard and the soft skills needed for organizations to respond to crises more effectively. In the context of crises, there are specific skill sets that need to be developed. Lalonde and Rue Defoe suggest that effective crisis response requires three levels of knowledge. First, conceptual or theoretical, so understanding previous research and theory related to crisis. Second, practical, gaining experience in the issues management process and also responding to crises. And third, reflective, being able to evaluate performance, outcomes, and best practices for the future. In the last several years within crisis research and practice domains, there's been a growing engagement between academic and practitioner crisis communities with improved exchanges of knowledge and experience in the classroom, at conferences, and in practice. Though students often challenge the salience and practicality of theory-based learning, good theory informs good practice and vice versa. As a testament to the dual importance of practice and theory, I would say this. Practitioners in crisis communication have challenged the academic community in recent years to develop and test more predictive theory to inform their own crisis decision making. 
I would argue that in our field, the recognition of both the importance of theory and practice is widespread. Theoretical, practical, and reflective knowledge can come in many shapes and sizes. This can range from news management and media relations to interpersonal and team skills to business administration and even includes information technology. This is also why crisis response capacity is not just the domain of communications professionals, but represents a multidisciplinary endeavor where technical specialists, ranging from management to communication to IT, must take on more strategic and managerial roles, not just those most directly related to their technical or their specialist skills. More than this, research connecting to learning and training consistently recognize that improving decision-making skills in moments of stress are critical if organizations and professionals are to build their crisis capacity. Research consistently points out that practice makes perfect, or at least better, especially when it comes to ethical decisions during crises. Likewise, improving practitioner self-efficacy or their confidence in their ability to react well during crises is vital to improving crisis performance and capacity. The thing is that broadly the types of knowledge needed for building capacity for effective crisis response also happen to be the types of skill sets that complement findings from across a number of reports related to the needed skills, traits, and capacities in the broader field of public relations. No matter whether we're talking about the Cook and Holmes report on PR in the UK, studies of practitioners from the US, or the European Communication Monitor, the results are consistent. The types of core skill sets that make for desirable practitioners also complement what it means to build crisis capacity within organizations. If we take these as starting points, blending conceptual, practical, and reflective skill knowledge bases, adding in distinctive multidisciplinary crisis knowledge discussed, then we can better understand that organizations must build capacity and crisis preparation from the inside out. And here's the sticking point for professionals. How do we get practice? How do we test ourselves outside of a real crisis? All professionals can and should certainly build conceptual and theoretical knowledge during their studies at university, in certification programs, or just by keeping up with the latest research and practice in the field. But who lets people loose on a crisis so that students and professionals alike can improve their practical and their reflective skills? An increasing number of practitioners and educators from across fields of business and communication to scientific fields highlight the importance of simulation for capacity building. A Harvard Business Review article in 2016 points out that while corporate tryouts are still in their infancy, they're an increasingly popular way to screen candidates through the interview process because they're able to see them in action. Also, as a result, they're being increasingly used from the C-suite to entry-level positions. Consultancies and firms are increasingly using simulations to improve performance, both internally and with their clients. When we look to the offerings from management and communications consultancies, there are an increasing number of these companies using simulation-based training in order to improve competencies for firms. KPMG, for example, highlights simulation-based training and assessment as a part of their key service offerings, suggesting that rehearsal mitigates problems and risks later. The research on simulation-based learning and training establishes a number of skills or learning benefits from simulations. Most of the relevant research on capacity building for organizations centers on learning in applied business or communications contexts. This table highlights a summary of the critical benefits offered from experiencing simulations as a part of capacity building for organizations. Not surprisingly, when we compare these findings with the key skills and traits needed in the field of communication more broadly, we find a pretty strong overlap. This is why so many more organizations are using simulations to build capacity. One of the reasons that good simulation-based learning is able to do this is that it targets efficacy. Efficacy is the belief in our ability to perform a specific action, as well as a positive prediction of what will happen when we perform that action. 
Albert Bandura separated these expectations into two distinctive types of efficacy, self-efficacy and outcome or response efficacy. He defined self-efficacy as the conviction that a person can successfully execute the behavior required to produce the desired outcomes. The outcome or response efficacy then refers to a person's estimation that a given behavior will actually lead to desirable outcomes. For example, one of the biggest reasons cited as a reason for low voter turnout in elections is that people often do not believe that their vote will matter. In this case, their concern isn't about whether they can successfully vote, self-efficacy, but about whether voting will result in a worthwhile outcome, response efficacy. Why do we care so much about efficacy when we're talking about capacity building for crisis response? Very simply because it substantially affects human behavior. For example, it governs choices about the behaviors that we'll attempt. The lower our self-efficacy, the less likely we are to try a behavior. No one likes to feel like they're failing. As a result, it influences our simple motivation to act and really becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yet when we target improving self-efficacy as part of capacity building, especially in a crisis context, we find that it's not difficult to improve employees' willingness and ability to act decisively and ethically across a number of business domains, but especially during crises. How does targeting good self-efficacy improve crisis capacity? First, it provides a mastery experience. This is how we answer the question I posed earlier. How do we improve capacity without turning people loose on crises that they're not ready for? Well, we simulate the crisis experience to give them a chance to make mistakes, bad decisions, good decisions, and the like. Second, it allows professionals the opportunity to model their behaviors and gain vicarious experience. Simulations can not only provide the practical mastery experience, but it provides a reflective opportunity as well. This can come with critical reflections on a person's own performance, as well as viewing how other people performed in the same or similar situations and developing best practices. More than just a case study, a simulation provides a more immersive experience. And third, it involves social persuasion as a tool for skill development. What I mean by this is that people can be encouraged to improve their performance and offered feedback on their performance in a low stakes context. Because of the practical and reflective nature of the simulations, people are primed for feedback to improve their performance. In an issues and crisis management context, simulation development also just makes sense because it supports module learning objectives like demonstrating the ability to critically evaluate and prioritize issues in complex and competitive international environments. Mm -hmm. It provides feedback on employing stakeholder relationship management approaches to manage risk. It allows learners to experience how to apply theory to crisis response decision-making so that they can articulate ethical and culturally appropriate crisis response recommendations. In short, it solves the chicken and egg question in crisis communication. How can we get experience if we don't have any? I'll leave you with this statement from one student who'd been through a full year internship before taking issues in crisis management and who was reflecting on the simulation experiences she had and the focus on crisis capacity. Her reflection was that during my placement year, there are a few major crises. Personally, I think they were not handled as well as they could have been. And I think a big reason for this was that they were not effectively undergoing issues management. I think in future roles, I'll be able to sell the benefits of investing in issues management. I also think that even if formal issues management processes weren't in place, if I'm working in corporate communications type roles, I would be able to carry out the issues management process once a month or so. This would give me the edge as a practitioner to be able to see what was coming internally or externally for the organization and be on top of any issues.